An awful dilemma, an awful decision. Your child is desperately ill with a genetic disease. Then comes hope, a radical solution using the latest gene technology. But there's a catch. You need a compatible donor to save your child. One that is genetically perfect and the only way to provide that donor is to create one. That means having another baby specifically designed to save your child. In America, the Nash family faced this dilemma. Their choice and their case has provoked a passionate ethical debate about a brave new world where children are bred for spare parts. Molly Nash is holding the brother who is about to save her life. In fact, Adam was created specifically for that purpose. Two children caught between medical technology and medical ethics over whether it's right to bring one child into the world to save another. This technology gave Adam life, a healthy life, and also gave Molly a second life, a healthy second life. And as parents, you would have done anything, I presume. Anything. I have done anything, and I will do anything, to save both Molly and Adam, and protect both Molly and Adam. Molly has Fanconi anemia, an incurable blood disease that leads to bone marrow failure, leukemia, and almost always death. We forgot to do it, my thing. Not long after Adam's birth, Molly began chemotherapy, causing her to lose her hair. Molly's disease is so rare, it often goes undiagnosed. When Lisa Nash was pregnant with Molly, the only clue she and her husband Jack had about their unborn daughter's condition was an ultrasound, which showed a minor abnormality of the heart. They gave us the option of terminating the pregnancy at 23 weeks. Well, Jack and I couldn't terminate a pregnancy, and you know, a baby that they'd say may just have a little bit of a birth defect. But what 14 more ultrasounds failed to detect was a staggering array of abnormalities. Molly was born without thumbs. Her right arm was a third shorter than her left. She was deaf in one ear and had two holes in her heart. And in addition to her birth defects that she had, that she was going to develop bone marrow failure and, and possibly leading to leukemia and if there was not some treatment like a bone marrow transplant, she would die. For a child to develop Fanconi anemia, both parents have to be carriers of the disease gene. Jack and Lisa were that one in a million genetic combination which not only caused Molly's birth defects, but the bleakest of futures. We lived every single day of Molly's life like it was the last. And we always did something fun and we didn't put anything off. Let's wait till tomorrow or next year. For six years, Molly's life was lavished with her parents' love, but spent isolated from the world. Her best and probably only chance of survival was a bone marrow transplant. But for there to be any hope, a suitable donor had to be found. I'm just gonna listen to you again, okay? And then we're just going to take a check in your throat. And your Molly ears, specialist, and Dr. John Wagner, a world authority on Fanconi anemia, okay. told the Nash family the chances of finding Molly a suitable transplant donor were slim. Yeah. Then, yeah. in 1997, he told them about a procedure that might save their daughter. The chance of having a successful outcome with unrelated donor transplant was on the order of 19%. There had never been a success done in IVS4, the mutation found in this family. And now, with this technology, we could provide them with that perfect donor within the family and a healthy child. And their chance of success is on the order of 85%. The science of saving Molly was extraordinary. Advances in genetic technology mean Fanconi anemia can now be detected at a very early stage of an embryo's development, when it's progressed to just eight cells. Lisa Nash's eggs were fertilised with her husband's sperm in a laboratory. The embryos they created were then genetically screened to ensure a disease-free baby who would also be a perfect bone marrow match for Molly. In effect, the Nashes were selecting one embryo from many to be their next child. 
Were there any ethical questions for you in doing this? We've talked about when we believe life begins. We've talked about what was ethical for us. It was more ethical to, to be able to determine in eight cells that the baby was sick or the baby was healthy as opposed to 20 weeks, you know, it, and then terminating a pregnancy. And I mean, I had seen a lot of 20-week babies. They come out, they breathe, they gasp. They, I mean, they are babies, they cry. So you don't mind the psychology of starting the creation process and then making a selection? No, not at all. I don't, I don't see it as a conflict at all. I don't see many embryos walking on the street. Can I ask you both, was your motivation to save Molly first? I wouldn't say that. Our motivation was to have healthy children. And we were given, when we were told this technology, we were told that they could test at eight cells for a healthy child and a bone marrow match. It took the Nashes five attempts to create and fall pregnant with a child who would be healthy and the right genetic match for Molly. On their last attempt, 15 embryos were created and genetically screened for the characteristics that they and Dr. Wagner were looking for. Of those, two had Fanconi anemia. So they were discarded? And they were left to degenerate. Um, of the remaining uh, uh, embryos, um, one was clearly, you know, Fanconi anemia disease negative and was the perfect donor for Molly and that happened to be Adam. Adam Frank Nash was born on August 29 last year, as healthy as his genetic screening had predicted. His umbilical cord was to be his sister's salvation. Cord blood, as it is known, is far more effective than bone marrow for transplantation in cases like Molly's. So we've taken this material, um, simply tested it, froze it down and waited for Molly to come for a transplant therapy. And, you know, it's worked spectacularly well. Molly held her brother as she received the transplant of his cord blood. Soon after, her immune system began to respond to the treatment. But the public response to this scientific first was mixed, questioning whether this was the beginning of children being conceived for their spare parts. It's a philosophical minefield, and, and I think it's not just questions about how far to allow people to apply this technique and choosing the characteristics of their children. It's also about what happens to the embryos that are not selected. Bioethicist Dr. Jeffrey Kahn cautions that genetic technology like that used to create Adam Nash should not be allowed to proceed unregulated. Just because we can do something, he says, doesn't mean we should. The fact that they're selecting characteristics that are not for that child but for somebody else certainly should give us pause. I think it becomes a problem ethically if it's not in the best interest of the child and that would be when a child is used as a mere means. It's an extension of what we've already ex have accepted, you know, at least in this society. And the question is, you know, when have you oh, gone beyond the limit of acceptable practice? And do you know where that limit is? No, I don't know what that is, except that, you know, um, as, as the user of this technology, I'm trying to do this responsibly. Is it possible, do you believe, with the technology that you were able to use to cross the ethical line? I think if people were looking for intelligence or, or hair color, eye color, or something like that, that, that may be crossing that line. But Dr. Khan's concerns go much further than simply being able to choose the child you want. And so let me paint another picture for you, which is, I think, more disturbing. If you allow a pregnancy to go to a particular point of gestation, say 21, 22 weeks, you don't need to have a live birth. You can actually have an abortion and use the cells that are in the liver for the same purpose, a stem cell donation. So there's nothing stopping couples from going that route creating an embryo, implanting it, letting it go to a particular point in gestation, and then having a therapeutic abortion for the purpose of collecting the tissue. And that, I think, is a commodification of a process that we don't feel comfortable with. You want to do that? Where's your glue? I'll do it. There's no doubt that ethical lines need to be drawn, and the Nashers are happy to have started that discussion. But they're equally sure that theirs was a responsible use of a new technology. I think the way that we're looking at it is that we are bringing to the forefront a technology that could avoid having sick children. 
why wouldn't you do whatever you could to save your child and to ensure that your child outlives you and has a healthy life and doesn't die at the age of seven, which Molly was on her way to doing. Those anymore. critics need to maybe volunteer some time on a bone marrow transplant unit and really see what children go through and maybe they'll have a different opinion after they're done. There still remains one little boy who may have something to say about it all when he's old enough to understand his place in the world. Will he be joyful or resentful at the reason he was conceived? Did you address at all the fear that Adam might suffer somewhere down the track believing he's only here to save his sister? No, Adam's gonna know that we love him because we want Adam and we want whatever other children we're going to have, not just because he saved Molly's life, but because he's Adam and we can't get enough food in him, and just because he's Adam and he giggles and he spits and he has a smile that would break anybody's heart, I mean, the Grinch would love Adam. Adam was not brought here purely to save Molly. Adam was brought here to be Adam. Oh, how different Alice and Greta were. Remember I have earrings like that at home? with spiders on them. And there is no doubt that beyond the ethical debate they unwittingly created, Molly and Adam are two very special children with a very special bond. They look into each other's eyes. Or if he's asleep and she might be crying, his eyes pop open like, what's the matter with my sissy? And I think, you know, they love each other. She bugs him, she sticks her fingers in his ears and his belly button and his nose. He doesn't cry. They will have a bond, I think, and he will know that he saved her life, and there's not very many babies that at the moment of birth can say they saved their sister's life. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.